and thank you for joining us on this somber day. I'm Teresa Marsenberg. And I'm Allie Peters. Today, we're going to be on TV and streaming online throughout the day as our community remembers fallen Rochester police officer Anthony Mazurkowitz. The casket carrying officer Mazurkowitz is still inside the public safety building. The procession to the funeral will begin shortly. Our colleague Adam Chodak will join us from outside the Blue Cross Arena shortly. But first, we want to focus for a few minutes on how we got to this somber morning. 11 days ago, on the night of Thursday, July 21st, gunfire on Bauman Street in Rochester, this time aimed at two police officers in an unmarked car along the side of the city's north side. The gunfire struck Officer Mazurkowitz and his tactical unit partner, Officer Sino Sang. Police say a total of 17 rounds were fired, and an innocent bystander, a 15-year-old girl, was also struck by one stray bullet. The young woman was not seriously hurt. Now there was a massive response from law enforcement across the area that night as the two officers were rushed to hospitals. Officer Sang, who was shot in the lower body, was treated and released. Just after midnight, we learned that Officer Mazurkowitz died due to his injuries despite heroic efforts by the hospital's medical team. And the next day, police announced the arrest of 21-year-old Kelvin Vickers. Vickers made his first court appearance on Saturday, and a Monroe County grand jury indicted him last week. Details of that indictment have not yet been released out of, the, out of respect for the family. Murder of a police officer, though, is generally charged as first-degree murder under New York state law. Of course, there are other, there's evidence and material that they will have to go through, but the district attorney explained that out of respect, they wanted to wait until after the services to go forward and to make the charges public. Well, dozens of officers preparing to descend upon Exchange Street this morning to the Blue Cross Arena where the funeral will begin just under an hour from now. The following downtown streets will be closed for the ceremony. Broad Street from South Avenue to South Fitzhugh Street, Court Street from South Avenue to Exchange Boulevard, and Exchange Boulevard from Main Street to South Fitzhugh Street. Now, right outside of the arena is where we find Adam Chodak. Adam, good morning. As we turn to you, set the tone for us. What's going on there? To everyone else out there, thank you for joining us as we come together. I am standing outside the Blue Cross Arena at the War Memorial. And the fact is, it is a beautiful day. Blue skies, calm winds, stand in stark contrast to the solemn atmosphere that we find here on Exchange Boulevard. We're going to go over my right shoulder here and you can see you have officers lined up a thick blue line right on Broad Street and they are waiting for the procession to begin. We have officers representing agencies from all over New York State here, state police, but of course RPD here in force to say goodbye to their fallen brother, Anthony. Mazurkowitz. This is a short procession, if you will. It's going to be going from the public safety building north on exchange and then into the Blue Cross Arena. So it is a short trek, but this has been a very long road for the Rochester Police Department. A fallen officer is the ultimate sacrifice, and it puts life into perspective for a lot of the men and women who are on the street, their families. In addition to that, we weren't here, we were here not all that long ago. Just eight years ago, we had Officer Daryl Pearson shot and killed and a very similar show of support, an outpouring of love and commitment only eight years ago. And then in between there, they've had tragedies. Manny Ortiz, Officer Ortiz, 
an accidental shooting in the leg. He passed away. An incredible amount of sadness for someone so respected. And then, of course, the attack on Denny Wright over on Peck Street took his eyesight. He is here today. He stands as a testament to the strength that so many officers have. And like Mazurkowitz, he was a veteran well past 20 years, but decided to stay on the street. And I think you're going to hear a lot about that throughout the day today, that Mazurkowitz could have not just gotten off the street, he could have retired. 54 years old, 29-year veteran of the force, he could have gotten off the street, and yet he stayed on and actually stayed in one of the most dangerous roles within the tactical unit, undercover officer. And in that role, he lost his life, and that's why we're here today. Again, we are going to have a procession coming from the public safety building. We're going to go over. You see the ladder trucks, two ladder trucks holding up the American flag. They're going to come under that. We have the Freedom Riders, mounted patrol. We have squad cars all waiting for this to begin. Joining me now is my colleague, Natalie Kuchko. Natalie, you were on scene that Thursday night. We're not going to get into the specifics of what happened that night again, but at the same time, I want to get your perspective. This is very quiet right now, and it just seems so different from what I was seeing through your eyes that night. Well, Adam, exactly that. You know, it's been just a little more than a week since we were on Bauman Street when this incident took place. And that night, the sheer magnitude of police response was astounding. You saw every agency in Monroe County assisting with this. You saw a neighborhood that was in serious concern, bystanders coming up to the media, going to other neighbors, asking what happened, what took place. And here today, you see that strong presence of first responders, but in a different light to mourn the loss of, of one of their own. And it is quiet, as Adam mentioned. You don't see sirens. Uh, you just see everyone standing guard to honor Officer Mazurkowitz. Uh, again, we are awaiting this procession, expected to begin any moment now. And also behind us, you can see we have about a dozen parked patrol cars from the Rochester Police Tactical Unit, of which Officer Mazurkowitz most recently served for parked in front of the main entrance here to Blue Cross Arena and behind us to the other side on Broad Street, hundreds of first responders uh, awaiting this procession. Absolutely. And Officer Mazurkowitz was there eight years ago to help honor Daryl Pearson and to help comfort his family. And now we're back here, his family, his wife, Lynn of 28 years, his Four children, or his five, yes, I believe four children, three grandchildren are here as well. A large family and a growing family. And they are joined by law enforcement. First responders of all stripes are here as well. And this procession is set to begin in just a few minutes. And we actually have a Mel L. Hell down at the public safety building where the casket is currently resting and we're going to go to her right now amel what is it like down there right now that's right adam we are at the public safety building right now where they are bringing out officer anthony uh, mazurka with this casket as of right now a moment of silence for this moment
As you can see, friends and family of Officer Mazurkowitz are now exiting the public safety building to make their way into position in the procession. As you can see, Officer Sino Sang is also here with us today. Officer Sang was there the night Officer Mazurkowitz was fatally shot. Officer Sang was shot as well. He is recovering in a wheelchair now. We're also seeing agencies showing up from across the state. In a motorcade, we have agencies from the Monroe County Sheriff's Department, Greece, Gates, Border Patrol, Brighton, the New York State Police Troop, or New York State Troopers, excuse me, and many more lining the streets of Exchange Boulevard as the procession is getting underway to make its way to the Blue Cross Arena, where a funeral is being held for Officer Anthony Mazurkowitz, killed in the line of duty. He was a veteran of the Rochester Police Department for 29 years, as we've mentioned, part of the tactical unit. Mel, thank you. Back here on exchange, we're waiting for the casket and the motorcade to roll underneath the flag, which is sitting just outside the Hall of Justice. As Amel mentioned, you have several different departments present here, and that's because they really do feel like they're all one community. I remember right around 10 years ago, the West Webster Christmas Eve ambush, we lost two firefighters, Mike Ciparini and Tomas Kachufka. Tomas Ciparini, a Webster police officer, a veteran of that department, and a similar outpouring that we're seeing here today. A loss of one is a loss to many in these ranks, and that is so clear once again today. Inside the arena right now, you have several uh, leaders, County Executive Adam Bello. You have the Chief of Police. All of them who are inside are watching a live stream of the procession right now they are waiting for the casket to enter the blue cross arena and once it's there the funeral will begin at noon i'm going to bring in natalie again because this funeral is going to incorporate a lot of different voices a lot of different parts of anthony mazurkowitz's life and natalie the speakers today uh I can only imagine how difficult it's going to be for them to get up in front of this crowd, Anthony Mazurkowitz's other family, and talk. Why don't we go over who we might hear from? Sure. So first, I mean, we can already feel the emotion outside and to think what's going to take place inside as well. Uh, today, we are expected to hear from the children of Officer Mazurkowitz. We're also expected to hear from friends of his, colleagues as well. Lieutenant Greg Bello with the Rochester Police Department did mention he is expected to make some remarks. So really, a, a vast majority of the people that were closest in Mazurkowitz's life, uh, ranging from all different circles, we are expecting to hear from in the funeral today. Yeah, and Natalie, the one thing that really gets me is while it is quiet now, about a half hour ago, we saw a lot of the officers, especially with RPD within the tactical unit, there were actually some smiles, a lot of hugs. It almost feels like for some, it's a relief to see other people here in support of Mazurkowitz and recognizing the sacrifice that he made. Certainly you have to imagine, I think, after so many days that it has been since this, this tragic incident took place, you know, to see those warm embraces, uh, you see members of law enforcement just consoling each other. Maybe they haven't seen each other in, in, in several days since this happened, uh, but today this will be a proper way uh, to say goodbye. And right now we are actually seeing what looks like the beginning of the procession. Uh, so we'll take a listen in here.
as the procession stretches towards us, I just want to remind everyone out there just how dedicated Anthony Mazurkowitz was to public service. He began in the Monroe County Jail as a jail deputy and then moved over to the Rochester Police Department on April 12, 1993. And he has been at it ever since. He was an officer, a patrolman with the Clinton and Goodman. The procession has just left the public safety building here and they are on their way down Exchange Boulevard. And agencies from across the state are here with them. And we'll tell us it back now to the studio with Allie and Teresa for more on Officer Anthony Mazurkowitz. And I think they described it so aptly, you know, um, Adam talked about a deep line of blue. You saw those officers lining the street from all across mm -hmm. the state. And when something like this happens in a community, understandably, people are looking for ways to show their respect, show their honor. And that has happened um, since this tragedy tragic killing took place a week ago. Um, you have um, the folks in Parrington, the yeah. Parrington town supervisor felt like we need to do something. And so they found ways to be able to give people in the community an mm -hmm. opportunity to, to give back, to do something, because it's always an overwhelming uh, feeling to, you know, this grief that, yeah. that grips the entire community. It's just incredible to see all the people down there, too. Um, how many people s showed up to support the Rochester Police Department? And how many people are sitting at home right now watching this who have supported the family um, of Officer Mazurkowitz, yes. Officer Singh? Um, it's just incredible. Let's take a listen here to the procession.
It does look like people are heading into the arena for the funeral of Officer Mazurkowitz. We just saw that procession kind of wrapping up there. Yes, um, the beat of the drums. It was, you know, a very quiet, moving moment. We're going to toss it now back to Adam Chodak, um, who is live on the scene. Adam. Thank you, Teresa and Allie. The casket is now being carried into the Blue Cross Arena. Family members and friends are following. And as you saw in that very touching moment with the Keystone Club, their drums and bagpipes, that was the only sound you heard outside of the drone overhead with literally hundreds of members of law enforcement and first responders standing at attention, saluting Officer Mazurkowitz. A very solemn and somber moment. And now they're taking the flag-draped casket in through the main entrance here on Exchange. It's going to eventually enter the north entrance of the arena and be taken to the southern part of the arena where the funeral service will take place. They are walking now single file, state police, entering the Blue Cross Arena. As all of that line, that steady line, remains out of tension. The hearse carrying officer Anthony Mazurkowitz passed by just a few minutes ago, preceded by the Keystone Club and the Honor Guard, the Color Guard. All of it formal, and yet the emotions so incredibly raw, especially for family and friends and all those he worked with. And he worked with so many people along the way. The Rochester Police Department, the Monroe County Sheriff's Office. And the fact is, a lot of you at home, you have relatives and friends in law enforcement, and by extension, you're hurting as well. And this is a moment where a community can come together and mourn together, and that's what's happening now. At this point, given how quiet it is here, I'm gonna to toss it back to Teresa and Allie in the studio. Okay, Adam, thank you. And um, he talked about the hurt and the trauma yeah. that not only the family, but Officer Mazurkowitz's brothers, you mm -hmm. know, in the force are dealing with at this time. Um, an incredible amount of grief and shock and a range of emotions yeah. that people are having to process at this at this moment. We have Dan McGuire who is mm -hmm. here who has extensive background and training with first response first responders. He himself has a um, 25 year uh, experience as a lead EMT. Um, advanced EMT rather for 25 years. Dan, thank you for joining us and thank you for um, being able to lend some of your expertise and sort of uh, share what EMTs, first responders and primarily police officers are feeling at this time and the things that they're having to process. Well, it's an absolute personal and professional honor to be here to help explain what's going on, the feelings, the reactions that happens when one of our own goes down. And as I've always said from the beginning, when there's a line of duty death of a police officer, EMS responder, any one of our responders, I simply tell people, get out of the way. Let them do their thing. Let them honor and respect the fallen. The, the details of the incident are still coming out, and 
th that's still going to be very hard for the family members, the partners, the, the people who worked with uh, uh, Officer Merkowitz. And it, it's not something that's going to be over when this is over. Uh, the, the trauma, the grief, the impact, the, the, the entire totality of how this happened, why it happened, and here we are again, seven years later, doing this again, is going to be a big factor of people's ability to get back to what I refer to as a sense of routine, a sense of normalcy. But when one of ours goes down, nobody goes back to normal. You do not go back to normal after one of our own has been killed in the line of duty. I've been there. I've gone through the three of these myself professionally. And just seeing today's broadcast brings back a lot of very strong, a lot of very sad memories, but also as time progresses, good memories of what this officer did. He could have retired after 20 years, but did he not? Did he? No, he stayed on the force. He dedicated himself to the protection of the city. And that's something I want every citizen out there today to fully realize for all of our first responders, when someone dials 911 and we show up, they expect perfection from us. Perfection no matter what's in front of us, no matter what we're seeing, hearing, smelling. And these officers did their job and, and it's an indeed an honor to be here to help honor Officer Merkowitz. And I think that's why today is so tough. You know, mm -hmm. uh, we talked about, um, we talked about Dan showing up and no matter what, being available for the community. And talk about what's going through um, these officers' mind um, right now, the range of emotions that they're feeling and we talked a little bit earlier um, before the service began about the you know the the tough guy syndrome mm -hmm. and how things have progressed um, unfortunately fortunately since the last time you were here in 2014 for the death of officer Daryl Pearson well in the emergency services are training uh, the calls that we go on, the, uh, the atmosphere within our organizations teaches us, trains us to, to be able to take chaos and bring it to control or some type of form of control. And that takes an, an ability that not everybody has and not everybody will have. And when one of our own goes down, and especially with a violent, needless event, what happened one week ago, these officers are looking for answers. They're looking for answers why, how could have this been prevented? Uh, where did this person come from? Uh, the, the grief, the trauma, the sadness, this is their way today, as we watch on live right now, their way to express that sadness and their honor and their respect for Officer Merkowitz. And when law enforcement has a line of duty death like this, they do this absolutely perfectly. They know what to do, how to do it, and they do it well. And within that process, that gives some 
condolence back to the surviving family, to the surviving department. Uh, even if you didn't know this, this gentleman, if you wear a badge of any type, and especially a law enforcement badge, we hurt. They hurt. Because this is not supposed to happen, but these officers take this risk every single day. Not everybody can do that, nor is everybody willing to do that. And every officer, when they get dressed and get ready to go to work, they know in the back of their mind they may not come home to their family. Mm -hmm. And th that is an incredible strength in which to have to continue to do your job, do your job well, protect your community, represent your organization as best you can, and still do the job that you were sworn to do. Dan, I want to talk about the hundreds of law enforcement uh, there right now. We can see them walking into the arena, waiting to go into the arena. I know um, this is common practice when an officer dies in the line of duty, but tell us what this means to the Rochester Police Department to see all these people there in support of them and in support of Officer Mazurkowitz. Well, I think you said the exact correct word, support. <laughs> The number of different uniforms and badges that are present there today, and I would make a very educated guess there may be uniforms and badges from out of state just to help support and to show their respect for this officer's sacrifice and to support that, again, surviving family. and. That surviving family is not only the officer's family, but the family of the Rochester Police Department and the nationwide family of all law enforcement officers, regardless of the badge that you wear. Uh, seeing this can be traumatic. It, it can push emotions to its limits, but these, these Men and women are professionals. They know what they need to do. They know they need to get through this event and to do their best, which they do every single day. And by seeing this line of blue everywhere, different badges everywhere, um, it, it is just an incredible feeling to be amongst that crowd, to see all of the people there to respect, to show support, to show sympathy, and to know that Officer Merkowitz will never be forgotten. And that is one of the key statements in this whole procession that you're seeing in this pageantry. I think that's a key word to use here, the pageantry that we're seeing right now, that this will not ever be forgotten. Mm. And that's how these officers, and especially that surviving family, the extended surviving family, get through this by seeing the overwhelming response from officers that, that they will never meet, that they will never know, they'll never speak to, but they know they're there, and they're there to show the love and support of Officer Mazurkowitz. One thing before we head back um, to our reporters on the scene, Dan, a lot of folks we talked about in the community are also hurting and wanting to express that same type of support and care. And sometimes, thank you, um, I'm sorry, don't feel like enough. What do you advise community members um, to do when, you know, for the next couple of days, the next couple of weeks, mm -hmm. when they see and they encounter officers um, and as they're moving about their daily lives? Well, I actually had that experience while shopping the other day. <clears throat> 
there was a chief officer that I know very well, um, and I just simply went up, shook his hand, looked him straight in his eye, and said, sir, my deepest sympathies to you and the, the men that you represent. And his eyes were quite glassy afterwards. It wasn't a long conversation. It doesn't need to be a long conversation. Mm -hmm. But just going up to these officers and shaking their hand, um, telling them thank you for what you do each and every day for us to keep our community safe, to keep our community uh, protected. They don't hear that enough. They simply don't. And they deserve that every day. And that's where the community can help by putting up the blue ribbons for the next couple of weeks, um, the uh, blue lights on their uh, house lights is another incredible sign of support. I, I saw a report earlier today about an ice cream shop that mm -hmm. has gone through hundreds of pounds of blue sprinkles for every ice cream cone sold for the last week just to honor Officer Merkowitz and the RPD and all other officers who's gone before him. Th these are small gestures. They don't have to be big. They don't have to be grand. They just have to be sincere and also make sure that we're not invading their space. And if they're not that responsive to your words, please don't take that as an offense. These officers are going through a tremendous loss, trauma, tragedy, and this is something they're going to have to remember and live with for the rest of their careers. Dan, thank you. I think that was important to say that they're small gestures, but they mean so much right. to folks in the community and especially um, this brotherhood yeah. of law enforcement. Anything you can do um, can go a long way. So. Very important there. Ah. We're going to keep talking to you, Dan, um, mm -hmm. as uh, the service progresses in about 15 minutes. Um, the service is expected to get started. We're going to take you back now live to Adam, Natalie, and Amel for coverage there on the scene. Adam. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you, Ali. So people continue to move into the Blue Cross Arena, that line that we saw earlier slowly breaking apart so people can move in and be part of the funeral service. Dan was talking about something interesting. He mentioned the difference between chaos and control. And we saw chaos on the night of July 22nd. And today we see the control, or at least the semblance of control. This has been a very difficult two to three years for the Rochester Police Department with the job that they have to do on the street and a very difficult decade. I keep thinking, I can't believe we're back here again. We were here eight years ago in 2014 with Daryl Pearson. It is eerily similar how everything is playing out. And you know, the last time we had someone die, a police officer in Rochester die of gunfire before Daryl Pearson was in 1959. That was Patrolman Harold Shaw. And they've had some tragedies after that. Officer Ronald Siver, 1984, he died drowning trying to save someone in Arondequoit Bay. And then we had Officer Thomas Clark in 2006 die of a heart attack on duty. But the violence taking a life of an officer is extraordinarily rare in Rochester. And yet here we are, less than eight years since Daryl Pearson. And as Dan mentioned, the folks that you're seeing enter the building, they've been living with the loss of Daryl Pearson since then. And now you add on Anthony Mazurkowitz. And I'm going to bring in Natalie Kuchko, who's been covering quite a bit of what we've been seeing on the streets of Rochester over the last two to three years. And Natalie, the fact is, is it not only affects the Rochester Police Department, but it affects first responders. It affects the entire community. 
You really saw an outpouring of support in the last week. It has been a little more than a week since the incident took place. Um, Mazurkowitz, his family from Parenton, we have seen an outpouring of support there as well as in the village of Fairport, really all over the greater Rochester area. You saw businesses making donations uh, to give to the official funds for the family of Officer Mazurkowitz. Um, really just goes to show the, the close knit in our community. Um, and here today, you know, we see this vast presence of dozens of agencies, hundreds of members of law enforcement just waiting to make their way in to, to pay their respects and to honor Officer Mazurkowitz's life. Absolutely. And Amel Elhel, you were there at the start of the procession when, to me, it really began to hit home. The journey of the casket from the public safety building where Officer Mazurkowitz had worked for so many years, up Exchange Boulevard, a street that he has traversed countless times, and then now into the Blue Cross Arena where an entire community is getting ready to say goodbye. What, what was that like uh, for those who saw the casket take off and start on that journey? Well, Adam, as the casket began to come out of the public safety building, really the only thing you could hear was silence until the motors from the, the engines from the cars there and the motorcade started for it. We have a look at the other end of where you are right now towards the Blue Cross Arena. And all day today, everything has been rather silent and somber, people taking in the moment. Um, I do want to talk about how uh, Officer Mazurkowitz uh, Throughout the last 11 days, the community has been highlighting who he was as an officer. And as Adam said earlier, we've heard stories from his co-workers stating he didn't have to serve as long as he did on the force, but he chose to do that because he wanted to serve his community. And we've also heard from RPD over the past couple of days about what a role model Officer Mazurkowitz was. He received the Excellent Police Service Award 17 times, which is an award I'm told from RPD is one of the highest honors they give out, and it's not very simple to obtain. He's also uh, received six to seven unit accommodation letters. RPD officials say that's over 50 incidents that have risen to the level of having documental, documental certi certification awards, excuse me. RPD officials also say Officer Mazurkowitz was the role model officer, having zero reports in his disciplinary file. And RPD is also awarding Officer Mazurkowitz with a Medal of Valor and a Purple Heart for his service. And as stated earlier, Governor Kathy Hochul announced that all flags on state buildings would be flown at half staff to honor fallen Rochester Police Officer Anthony Mazurkowitz. And that has gone beyond state buildings. Every flag I have seen in Rochester today has been flown at half staff. Adam. Amel, thank you so much. And that gets to a point that Bob Duffy made, the former police chief, the former Rochester mayor who knew Anthony Mazurkowitz very well. He said he was a man who never shied away from a case. He took on the hardest ones. Beyond that, though, and this is the one that stuck with me, is he took great care in training his partners. So over the year, you can over the years, you can imagine how many lives he touched, but also how many people carry on his knowledge and impact into the community and that will survive this in a way that will be part of his legacy that his approach his dedication is now resting inside officers who are on our streets uh, who are in our courtrooms who are in our jails and that is that type of mentorship really struck home so take away all the awards which are incredible take away all that and you have many people in the department who owe him a tremendous amount for who they are as people and as officers at this point. And right now we have people continuing to line up, move in. The Monroe County District Attorney Sandra Dorley also here with many members of her office. They have made their way in. The funeral service set to begin at noon. There will be a list of speakers 
A prayer will begin the service, and then we expect to hear from family members, from the Rochester police chief, from the police union, the Locust Club president, Mike Mazio. We also expect to hear from a friend or two of Mazurkowitz, who had many over the years, Bob Duffy telling me that he had a very dry sense of humor. He was a very funny individual on top of his dedication, and we heard that from a number of people who knew him. We'll also hear from fellow officers. Just getting back to Daryl Pearson for a moment, because the two cases are so interconnected. In May, every year, they have Police Week in Washington, D.C., and one of the biggest moments in that is a candlelight vigil at the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial. I was there in 2015 for Daryl Pearson, and that's where they unveil the newly etched names in the wall, officers who died killed in the line of duty. That year, 131 officers had their names put on that wall. Daryl Pearson's was there. They then had a ceremony the next day outside the U.S. Capitol. The president spoke, and it hit home just how extensive this community is. We talked about agencies coming from all over the state, but this is a national community, and so there is mourning throughout the entire country right now over what happened here in Rochester on Thursday, July 22nd. And in May, in all likelihood, we'll be back in Washington, D.C. for Police Week, and Officer Anthony Mazurkowitz's name will be on that wall. And to add to this, May 2015, the entire tactical unit of which Mazurkowitz was a member was there. And now everybody behind me here to pay their final respects. And after this funeral, they will take Mazurkowitz's casket out of the arena and move it closer to home, to Whitehaven Cemetery. There will be people lining the streets to say goodbye. And just now, you can hear some bagpipes off in the distance cutting the silence. You hear sirens. Perhaps on a job, actually. It's unclear whether they're part of this ceremony, because at the end of the day, there are officers on our streets right now doing their jobs. Firefighters on the streets doing their jobs. Medics, paramedics, EMTs on the streets doing their jobs. It doesn't stop. And it won't stop after this. But as Dan mentioned, Teresa and Allie, it will change even if it's in a small way years from now, it will change their outlook. It will be something that they carry with them. I remember a long time ago someone saying, if you're in a difficult field, you have a backpack, and every difficult thing you come across, you put a pebble in and you don't really notice. And then over time, the pebbles add up and it can become too hard to bear. They're putting a rock in their backpack today. And this is going to be very hard for them to carry. But we know that they're going to continue to do so. And we know that in part because of what we're seeing today, the support, the coming together, the statement that what Anthony Mazurkowitz, what Daryl Pearson, what Denny Wright, what Manny Ortiz, what Harold Shaw in 1959 was doing was for the community. And that's the statement they're making today, uh, that, that that will be carried on in Mazurkowitz's mentees and his entire department and agencies all across New York State and the country. Teresa Alley, I'm going to send it back to you as we start to reach the last quarter of the thick blue line as they separate and enter and get ready for the funeral to begin.
In just a few minutes, thank you, Adam, that funeral will be starting. I wanted to continue along that thought. You talked about the statements that they're making, and often the family makes statements, too, before. We talked about there's several of Officer Mazurkowitz's family members mm -hmm. are expected to uh, address the mourners there today at the funeral. But in the obituary, I thought it was very poignant and telling what the family put together um, and wanted folks to remember, how they want people yeah. to remember Tony. It says, um, Tony, as they call as the family calls him, mm -hmm. Tony will be remembered as a witty jokester who could make anyone laugh. To his family, he will always be the absolute best man that ever existed. Wow. And this is very, this, this is very touching, and there will be more, I'm sure, tender moments. Mm -hmm. But in the obituary, it says, in Tony's honor, Please take an extra evening to cancel whatever else you had planned and instead share a good meal, stories, and laughs with your family. What we wouldn't want to give to spend even one more night like this with wow. him. And as I mentioned, it was very telling to see that they want people to remember um, that he was a family man. He was. And that he loved his family, his children, his grandchildren the jokester, and then he liked some of the just simple things in life and being able to be um, with those who are most close to him. He was married for 28 years and yes. a father of four all over the age of 20. Three grandchildren, you heard Adam say that, um, all young. Yes. Under the age six and young, uh, uh, six and under I should say, but it sounds like just an incredible incredible man incredible family will be missed by so so many last night we saw the community come together again uh, for calling hours which were held in Parenton at Keenan funeral home uh, long into the night we had a procession there brought officer Mazurkowitz down to the public safety building his last call acknowledged on that dispatch you can see the video here numerous community members lining the streets coming out to show their support last night and today it's just been incredible to see everyone come together and we know the rochester police department has had some tough years oh yeah some very tough years but i hope that they feel love and support in this moment right I think it was um, Adam, someone mentioned, it's the community as a whole. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, um, the violence is uh, gripping this community in a mm -hmm. way that many folks have said that they've never seen before. And it's just, um, you don't want to think about it, no. but it's the reality. Um, and then, and folks are looking uh, looking for solutions and looking for ways to, as we talked about, support and wrap yeah. their arms around this family and the law enforcement community. You heard Dan mention the ice cream shops yes. and the businesses that were actually um, donating proceeds from blue sprinkles on mm -hmm. their ice cream and had to get more blue sprinkles yes. because. Um, there was just so much um, support for that. Yes, we had those, uh, we had the Chill and Grill in Palmyra, Papa mm -hmm. Jack's and Victor and Happy Days and Henrietta, all Rochester area ice cream shops that were donating a dollar from every ice cream sold with blue sprinkles. And the money mm -hmm. will be sent to the Rochester area police union in support of Officer Mazurkowitz's family. One thing I saw that I loved was the barber shop in Parenton yes, yes. offering free haircuts to Rochester police officers, uh, not only them, but their families as well. Um, and he talked about it, and he was just like, I want to do something good for the community. Mm -hmm. Everyone can do something their part in their own way, uh, using their own skills, their own talents. Um, and it's been cool to see you know, barber shops, flower shops, uh, arts and craft stores, yes, get involved. getting together. And in any little way possible, supporting this family, supporting the Rochester Police Department. It's been, um, it's been 
uplifting, uplifting to see. Uplifting to see, yes. It certainly has. There's the florist there that was helping with the ribbons. Um, and you, you, you have to know, and we did see on social media, Officer Mazurkiewicz's wife and um, some of his children express mm -hmm. uh, gratitude for yeah. the show of support that they've seen in the days following his untimely death. Um, and it's important to mention, you know, Officer Mazurkiewicz is only 54. Right. He had a lot of life mm -hmm. ahead of him. Um, so this service is expected to start any minute. Now you're seeing um, mm. mounted patrol. Yes, from the procession. Um, I think we are going to send it back down before the actual service begins to Adam and Natalie and Amel. Adam. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you, Ellie. So the final members of law enforcement have entered the arena. I can see them. They're through the doors and they are making it up the stairs to take their seats. The Freedom Riders who always willingly turn out for these events when invited. They are standing outside, I believe, waiting to enter as well. They have left their motorcycles behind. They appear to be the final members of the audience who have yet to get in. It has been open to family and friends and, of course, members of law enforcement. But, of course, we're going to stream this for the entire community. And in addition to the speakers, Natalie, we're going to have quite a bit of reflection afterwards as well, if I'm not mistaken, a ceremony outside. It really speaks to how choreographed this has to be and should be in order to pay respects to someone like this. Yeah, I mean, for the, the hour or so that we have spent before the actual service and then within the service, hearing from the, the variety of speakers we're expected to hear from, and then carrying the ceremony outside for a folding of the flag, uh, continued uh, payment of respects uh, before laying Officer Mazurkowitz to rest. Absolutely. And then we're going to, of course, hear taps, which... I can't imagine will be very easy for anybody. Just the bagpipes themselves offered a very emotional moment for everybody standing by, waiting to move into the funeral. And Amel, at the end of the day, we talk about Anthony Mazurkowitz as an officer, as a veteran of the force, as a member of the tactical unit. At the same time, we're seeing a funeral for a person a person with a family and uh, that is not lost in fact it probably takes priority the knowledge of that uh, to those who who know him best yeah that's absolutely right adam as you said earlier the crime gripping this community over the past few years has been nothing but heartbreaking. We've seen 44 homicides to date this year, I think over that number at this point. And to see the life of an officer taken along with those lives is very hard for much of the law enforcement community. And as Teresa had said earlier, in officer Anthony Mazurkowitz's obituary, his family had put a note in there about making sure to spend time with your family just as they wish they could have had another night with him. I think that sentiment really resonates with the entire community. Everybody has a family and friends and people they love. And another sentiment knowing that, you know, someone who lost their loved one in such a tragic way. They're asking you to take a moment to spend time with your family and to really understand life and how precious it is and how short it may be. A message I think we should all be taken very seriously today and take home today. Adam. Absolutely, Amel, and I hope that folks out in the community 
who are perhaps engaged in some of the violence that we've been witnessing take note of this, the, the true loss, and not just this loss, but all of the victims uh, throughout the year, the 15-year-old girl who was shot on Thursday, July 22nd, diving for cover in her own home, a bullet piercing the wall and hitting her. I mean, that is just... It's terrifying, and it's, it, it just extends the tragedy that we're witnessing now. You know, there's going to be time for us to reflect as well, and I know the parent in town supervisor has talked about building some type of permanent memorial to Anthony Mazurkowitz. We're going to have to see where that takes shape, what form, when. But in all likelihood, that will happen. It did happen for Daryl Pearson. There's a sculpture of him in the village of East Rochester uh, right now. And you can go see it and uh, reflect upon his sacrifice. And so we're going to be talking about this for quite some time, talking about Anthony Mazurkowitz's sacrifice. And the hope amongst many here is that that sacrifice is not in vain, that perhaps that statement that we were talking about early, earlier resonates throughout the community. I'll note too that the tactical unit, almost all of their cars are lined up here on Exchange Boulevard. Cars that Mazurkowitz knows very well. People who ride them, he knew very well. And to go back to my opening point, this is their friend. This is a person, and while there's going to be a lot of talk about the badge and the blue line and all that, and rightfully so, at the end of the day, they're mourning Anthony Mazurkowitz, the guy with the crass humor who could make anybody laugh. And that's lost now. The doors have shut to the Blue Cross Arena. Some of the cars are pulling away. Attention now moves inside to the arena floor, the south side where the casket will sit while speakers will eventually take the podium. A prayer will begin the funeral service, which should begin momentarily. We will continue our coverage of this throughout the funeral, but especially afterwards as they drive the casket out of the arena over on to 490 East, a road he, like so many of us, knew so well, off onto 31F and eventually to Whitehaven Ceremony, Whitehaven Cemetery, where so many of us have loved ones right now. Another reminder of how this is a community gathering. This is a community period of mourning. The flag still hovering over Exchange Street, two ladder trucks holding it high. But this part, this procession has concluded and the next stage of this process is about to begin. And